सहनावतो सहनो घनक्त सह वीर्यंकवाहे तेजस्वीनावधेतमस्तु मद्विषा वहे ओ शांति 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 This week we are going to discuss the 15th chapter of the Gita. I think perhaps the most famous chapter. It is here also because we chant it every day before the meals. And we'll discuss in the course of discussing this 15 chapters to why we chant it before the meals in the dining hall. But this is a one of the shortest chapters only consisting of 20 verses there are two chapters in the gita which have only 20 verses the 12th and the 15th <coughs> but it's one of the most beautiful chapters it is called purushottama yoga the subject matter of the this 15 chapter is purushottama purusha purusha means the self or the consciousness purusha uttama purusha the most exalted self <clears> or <throat> well, it reveals how the self is most exalted how the person the self is in fact purushottama the most exalted this is what is revealed in the 15th chapter it is naturally in continuation of the 14th chapter that 14th chapter was called gunatraya vibhaga yoga wherein the three gunas were discussed the personality was discussed in the 14th chapter our personality oh and gupta low the volume a little bit as there is humming sound the as we have been saying each one of us is a is a union of this two entities the person and the personality the spirit and matter the self and the non self this personality was elaborately described in the 14th chapter as can made up of the three gunas our personality is made up of the body sense organs mind intellect that forms the personality and that is the vehicle or the medium through which the person the self or the consciousness manifests just as electricity requires a medium such as a filament bulb in order to manifest itself and similarly also the self or the consciousness as though it requires this medium of the personality so personal person or the self or the consciousness acting through functioning through the personality becomes this individuality this every individual that's what also lord krishna said in the 13th chapter every individual is a union of this person and the personality the spirit and the matter spirit enveloped in matter spirit manifesting through matter like an actor functioning through a costume or in playing a certain role and so also one purusha or the one spirit manifesting through various personalities manifesting through various roles is what we call all the living beings not only living beings but even what we say even the insentient beings the sentient and insentient whatever we have in this world is nothing but the manifestation of one purusha one self one consciousness one intelligence and therefore in the ultimate analysis we do not even have such divisions as sentient and insentient the divisions of the sentient and insentient jada and chetana these divisions are made by us for the purpose of our day, day to day interaction or transaction but when we look at the truth of what we call even insentient or inert it will turn out to be nothing but the same intelligence the same consciousness in short all these chapters have been telling us how that one consciousness or intelligence or god or brahma alone manifest has manifest or manifest itself as this whole universe consisting of the sentient and insentient beings including of course myself and to reveal the knowledge this knowledge is the purpose of all the scriptures of the vedas upanishads bhagavad gita and in different ways this is unfolded in different chapters one of the important things to be done is what we call viveka the discrimination between the spirit and the matter 
It is very important for us to know that the spirit is, is different from the matter to begin with. So what is happening is the spirit of the person on account of identification of the personality takes itself to be a small or limited being. And therefore, as this morning we were told, every human being is a self-conscious being. But conscious of a self which is limited in every way. Limited in time, limited in place, limited in ability, limited in every way. Thus I find myself a self-conscious being, but limited in every way. And it is this sense of limitation that impels me or compels me also to do something so that I become free from this sense of limitation. I cannot accept for myself, I cannot accept being, a li being limited in any way. I cannot accept being dependent, I cannot accept being helpless. I cannot accept being small, I cannot accept being limited. I find myself limited, find myself small, I find myself dependent, I find myself helpless and I cannot accept it. And therefore all the time I'm struggling to become free from that. So this whole process is called samsara. This struggle is constantly going on. And the scriptures in fact want to provide, provide the answer as to how to fulfill this struggle. Thus we are born with a certain agenda, with a certain purpose and that is to fulfill the struggle to become free from every sense of smallness or limitation or helplessness. And each one of us has been trying this, not only in this lifetime but from the lifetime, from this, this process going on from the time beginning less from one embodiment to the other, this is how it is going on. And that does not seem to be an answer, whatever a human being does in his or her life, does not seem to bring a sense of freedom, seems to bring a temporary respite and again I find myself again being small or limited or bound. And therefore that does not seem to be an abiding or a lasting solution. And the scriptures provide us what we call a lasting solution of seeking freedom from the sense of smallness. And the solution is very simple. At least Vedanta solution is very simple. And that is, that this sense, this smallness that I am feeling, or limitation that I am feeling, or helplessness that I am feeling, is in fact false. Is what we call mithya, is apparent. At least this, word, this much must be clear to us as far as the word mithya is concerned. Whether, whether the world is mithya or not becomes immediately clear to us or not. But this should become clear to us that a sense of smallness or limitation is definitely mithya. What is mithya? Mithya is that which appears to, which is not really there but which appears to be there. Yet dasad bhasmanam, that which is not there but which appears to be real. Swapna gajadivat, like the elephants and mountains etc. appearing in the dream which are not really there but while I am dreaming they appear to be real to me. Similarly also the sense of smallness which is so real to me. So it's my intimate experience, my gut feeling that I am not alright. So this is an intimate knowledge on my part about myself that I am a limited being. As we said, if I was happy being a limited being, there's no problem. Unfortunately, I cannot happy being limited. No one can be happy being limited. We don't find a single person, single normal person who is happy being limited. Why is it so? Because it is opposed to my nature. It is contrary to my nature. It is a rule generally that everything is comfortable with its own nature. A thing is comfortable being what it is. Water is comfortable being cold. No struggle. Ice is comfortable being cold. What is comfortable flowing from higher level to a lower level. The same water when it is heated, when it becomes hot water, then it is not comfortable with itself. It finds itself in an unnatural condition, never it struggles to become free from that heat. So heat water, heat the water and leave a glass of hot water, we'll see a process going on, water constantly struggling to become cool. And the struggle will go on until the water becomes cool. And then there is no struggle. Like the river also, river is separated from its source and the ocean, its natural level is sea level. 
and when it is at a level higher than that, it cannot accept it. Therefore, we find the river constantly rushing, struggling. And when it becomes one with the ocean, then the struggle is over. Thus, the struggle becomes over when one attains one's natural state. And there is a struggle when I am in an unnatural state. Like this, when we, when we pull the spring, is always in tension. And you release it, the ten- when it attains its natural state, the tension is gone. Thus, whenever we feel tension, whenever we feel stress, it must be that I am not in my natural state. I am somehow deviated or separated from my nature. And therefore, there is a struggle constantly on our part to become our natural self. That is freedom, simple as that. What is called moksha or liberation is nothing but being what I am. And what is bondage is being different from or opposite of what I am. So being deviated from my own nature and therefore living in an unnatural state for whatever reason is called bondage and getting back to my natural state where there is no struggle at all and thus being my natural self is a state which is free from all struggle and stresses this is called moksha liberation freedom from all stress once and for all this Vedanta teaches us as to how this sense of limitation and all the effort the struggle that goes on to become free from limitation which is called samsara this is called samsara it is not that because I am born that I am a samsari or that I have a body that I am a samsari that I have a family therefore I am a samsari or that I am doing things that I am a samsari. There is no samsara. At least that Vedanta explains samsara is this struggle to become free. A never ending struggle. Like the struggle of this tenth man to find the tenth man is a never ending search. When the tenth man is searching for the tenth man, when can you ever find him? Never. And similarly also, this person is trying to find the freedom from the helplessness and doesn't seem to ever find it. Because, in fact, this samsara, the sense of smallness, as you said, is mithya. is not really there, but it appears to be real. It is called brahma, it is called bhranti, projection, superimposition, delusion, whatever you call it. And thus, the main, main, main problem in our life is what we call ignorance. And the bhranti of the delusions that are born of ignorance. And therefore, all kinds of notions or misconceptions that I entertain about myself, they are the reason for my suffering and there is no other reason. So as, as Upanishads explain, as Bhagavad Gita explains, there is no reason whatever why there should be any unhappiness or sadness or suffering in my life, whatever. For the simple reason that the self is what I am trying to be. Just as the tenth man is what he is searching for and similarly also whatever it is that I am searching for in my life is what I already am. Namely, I am already free. And therefore, the samsara is Nothing but a product of ignorance. This is the basic uh, diagnosis of the what we call the problem of human problem of suffering, human problem of sadness, this human struggle. There's nothing wrong in struggling. There's nothing wrong in doing things. There's nothing wrong in achieving things. Everything is fine. All of that really becomes enjoyable. All the life becomes enjoyable. When this thing goes away, that's all. When this ignorance and this notion of complex is born of ignorance, when they go away, then whatever I do becomes a real thing. Then life becomes nothing but a process of, process to be enjoyed. Until then, that very thing becomes a tremendous burden. Knowledge and ignorance makes all the difference. Like this, like this person, this young man had a big motorbike, a huge motorbike. And of course, he would ride his motorbike and whatever, because he was a master of riding this motorbike. He had a servant. The poor servant did not know how to handle this motorbike. A huge thing. So once this young man says to his servant, Hey, come on, go across the street to that gas station and let, uh, fill up this motorbike with the gas and bring it back. Servant says, okay. Now he did not know how to ride the motorbike, so he had to pull it. 
but that also requires certain skill you know when the motorbike is so huge so heavy so this fellow was trying to pull this motorbike to that gas station across the street and then its weight would come you know and he would fall down the whole motorbike would be on him sometimes he fall this way and that way and you know it took him 15 minutes to reach there another 15 minutes to come back this half an hour was like hell for this person how many times he fell down how many times he almost crushed by that motorbike he did not know how to handle this motorbike the gas was filled and this owner of the motorbike comes the young man gives a kick and rides he can enjoy the motorbike because he knows how to deal with it. other for other fellow that very thing which is a matter of enjoyment for him is a tremendous burden for the person who does not know and similarly also the samsara for us is like a motorbike we don't know how to handle it sometimes i fall this way and some other way and just keep on falling and being crushed under different weights not knowing how to handle it and the wise man is a person like that young man who knows one kick and the motorbike goes dukkheshu anudvigna manaha sukheshu vekatas praha vidaragahaya krodaha sthitadhirma niruchyate dukkheshu anudvigna manaha in the situations where generally called painful by other people anudvigna manaha he doesn't get perturbed sukheshu vekatas praha in the situation other people get tempted he doesn't get tempted. Vidaragahaya krodha. Everybody functions from, from attachment, from fear, from anger. So they are the generally motive forces that, that motivate me to do things or that compel me to do things. Vidaragahaya krodha. Here is the one who is free from fear, who is free from anger, who is free from raga means attachment, uh, attachment or dependence. So that is a person who can enjoy himself and who can enjoy this life. And that's all Vedanta wants us to do, is to enjoy this life. And that is what Bhagavad Gita or Lord Krishna would call the greatest siddhi or greatest achievement, accomplishment. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna does not talk of any other kind of account siddhis. Siddhis of the mind and all kinds of spiritual powers. They may be there or not, that's okay, fine. But that is not the important thing. In the vision of Bhagavad Gita, important thing is this, just to gain freedom, and that freedom can be gained only by knowledge, because the bondage is a product of ignorance. This is very, very important. Ignorance is a problem, and nothing else is a problem. There is no other reason, supposedly, for my unhappiness. Nobody can make me unhappy. Nobody can make me sad. Nothing or nobody can make me unhappy or sad. If I do not project, as we say, when I take the film, pictures to the camera, I click and the shutter opens and, and the scene outside creates an impression among that film. So this is how the pictures are there. Every time I click, the shutter opens, there is an impression. Every time I click, shutter opens, there is an impression. Now imagine that instead of the regular film, suppose we fill a, a piece of white paper in this, you know, a roll of just plain paper in this camera, suppose. And now you keep on clicking, the shutter opens, but no impression at all. So world is what it is. Even clicking also is there, opening of shutter also is there, all the vyavahara interaction also is there, but no impression at all. So that the impressions take place on this, on this photographic film is not only because there is world outside and there is, an, there is an interaction of the world, not only that, but there is something in the film also, inherently there in the film also, because of which the impressions take place and that is that chemical coating which is there. And therefore, similarly also, whenever I seem to interact with the world, I seem to keep on getting some little hurt little insult now, little hurt, little jealousy, little resentment, little fear, little threat, little anger, little happiness also of course, now and then. This, every time I seem to relate to the world or interact to the world, these kind of things keep on happening to me. 
And I have concluded that this world is like that, Swami. Look at this world. How, what an amount of cruelty is there, what an amount of this is there, what an amount of that is there. And therefore, world is the source of all my problems. Not recognizing that, at this time, I am like that film with a chemical coating which allows the world to create all kinds of impressions or impact upon me. If I become like that paper, that's all, then all the inter interaction of the world can be there and still I would not be in any way affected. By not being affected, we do not mean that I become insensitive. No, as we said, then only my, this morning Swamiji talked about, and we'll continue to talk about the two kinds of creations. One is called Ishwara Sushti, the creation of the Lord, of the giver. Other is what we call the objective creation. Other is what we call Jiva Srishti, the creation of the individual. What we call the subjective creation or subjective projection, the projection of the mind of the individual. That's all. So it is because of that subjective creation, it is because of projections or misconceptions in my own mind, it is because of my own distorted perceptions that the world manages to threaten me and the world manages to create all kinds of stresses and difficulties for me. And what I do today is I keep on trying to change the world around me so that I can be comfortable in the world. That is also one way of life, that is called the life of bhoga, changing things around myself. So I surround myself with all comfortable things. Comfortable ob objects of pleasure, of different kinds. Vedanta says, well, that is not going to solve the problem. Rather than trying to change things around, maybe you should change yourself. Bring a transformation in yourself. And then things as they are will become enjoyable. You don't have to have a special kind of music to enjoy things. Music is always there. Provided my mind is available at night also when I'm sitting in my, in my study. And if I'm concerned about what's going to happen tomorrow, or what happened today, and this and that, and what I'm struggling with something, then that's all right. But when my mind is quiet, then I can see what a symphony is going on at night also. All those insects are making wonderful sounds at night. A sim night symphony is going on. Early morning other symphony is going on. A lot of music is there. Not that we should not enjoy the other music, but all this is there. Provided, even when I go on the, you know, for a walk on that macro, there is a nice section there, wooded section. And lots of birds are there. All one has to do is to, if I am in a hurry to go to the stop sign and come back, then it's okay, I don't hear anything. But if I am at, I have a sudden leisure, then I can enjoy the chirping of the birds. Wonderful. <clears throat> and so, all that is required is a mind that is free. And a mind, only an enlightened mind can be ultimately free. Freedom also in Bhagavad Gita has been discussed in two stages. One is to become free from all those impulses of attachments, aversions, anger, lust, etc. And secondly, to become free from ignorance. And so, thus, what these chapters, beginning from 13th chapter, are all Jnana Yoga. The first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita all discuss Karma, action, Karma Yoga. The middle six chapters from 7 to 12 primarily discuss Bhakti Yoga, the devotion to the Lord. So, chapters 7 to 12 talked about God. And the way to relate to God is devotion, Bhakti. The first six chapters talked about the self. And to relate to self is to do things properly. So, how to act properly became the subject matter of the first six chapters because there the subject matter was the self. How to relate to the world? which is nothing but manifestation of God, that is called bhakti or the devotion, and also God and the devotion. So self and the karma or the action were the subject matter of the first six chapters. God and devotion were the subject matter of the middle six chapters. And now the last six chapters talk about, and of them also, these three chapters, 13, 14 and 15. These in particular talk about jnanam, talk about the knowledge. And so, this 15th chapter is, is going to talk about the knowledge of the Self, knowledge of God, and the, the famous equation, Tattvamasi. The identity between Tat and Tvam. Tvam being the Self, 
for being the Lord and identity, oneness. This underlying everything. That tat means that includes everything other than myself. Everything other than myself is included in one pronoun, tat. And second is tvam or aham, that's the subject and object. The object is taken to be different from the subject. In fact, subject and object are one alone. So underlying identity between the whole existence is what is revealed in this chapter also. That's the subject, that is the vision of the Upanishads. That's also the vision of Bhagavad Gita and there is also the vision of the 15th chapter. So here we find a discussion of who is this Tvam? What's the nature of the self? We also find a description of what is the nature of God. And then we find also the oneness or identity between the two. <coughs> so as we said, this is the theme of the whole Gita. In that process, in the 14th chapter, we said, in order to help us separate the self from the non-self, the, the non-self of the personality was, was described there or was explained there as consisting of three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas. How our personality, our mind, our sense organs, our body, all of this personality is made up of sattva, rajas and tamas. And what's the self? Gunatita. The self is the one that transcends the three gunas, transcends the personality. That means the one who is free from the effects of the personality. One who is unaffected, untouched by the personality, by the gunas, he is gunatita. So this was the subject matter of the 14th chapter. The Lord, Lord Krishna in the 14th chapter gave a detailed description of the three gunas not for the sake of the gunas, but in order for the sake of the self, who is gunatita or the one who transcends the gunas. So at one point Arjuna asked this question, O oh Lord, what is the characteristic of this guna? What is the characteristic? So what are the lakshana, the characteristics of the wise man who is enlightened, who knows himself as, as beyond the three gunas? And kimachara, how does he conduct himself? And katham trin guna divartade. And what's the method by which one can transcend the three gunas? That is, one can gain the knowledge of the self which is beyond the three gunas, substrate on the three gunas. You know, all the projections are taking place and there must be a basis for the projection, that's the self. Like this, as we have the example for the transcendence, the transcendence that we are giving is that of a crystal. So how crystal obliges, you know, so that which is pure always becomes it's, it's Swamiji says, you know, a sitting duck for all kinds of transference. Sometimes Swamiji tells, you know, says, when I was sometimes telling you some difficult, some dif- you know, things that are happening, says Swamiji says, you are a sitting duck for all transference. What is meant by sitting duck means what? That you can easily become the object of that. Brahman is a sitting duck for all projections. Just as the crystal becomes available for any kind of a projection. And thus you may place a flower, which is pink flower, and the crystal appears to be pink. And orange cloth, crystal appears to be orange. And whatever be the color, that's what the crystal appears to be. And therefore, this crystal, itself being free from every color, itself being transparent, itself being pure, therefore, any kind of a projection or superimposition can be done on this. By itself, it transcends the colors, we say. What is meant by transcending color I means it is free from effect of any color. So even when it appears to be pink, the beautiful thing is that even when the crystal appears to be pink, it remains free from the effect of pinkness. Even when crystal appears to be orange, it remains free from being orange. This is what is meant by transcending. That, that the crystal pervades every color at the same time is free from every color. So the self takes all the roles. The self or the Atma takes all the roles. Prananeva prana bhavati vadan vak pashyan chakshuhu. So the self in identification the organ of speech becomes speaker. Pashyan chakshuhu in identification the organ of seeing he becomes seer. In identification the faculty of hearing becomes hearer. In identification the faculty of thinking becomes thinker. That's fine. 
all of that we can call embellishment or no, value additions. If this personality was not there, the self could not do all these things. So it's nice that the personality is there, that the self, otherwise all transcendental, complete, whole, that's all fine. But he cannot walk and talk. Brahman cannot talk and walk. So Brahman talks, Brahman walks, Brahman thinks, Brahman does all this through this personality. So this personality becomes like a value addition, which enables or embellishment, which enables Brahman to do all this. But when you don't know, all that very same thing becomes a problem. Like a, a, a multi-millionaire actor assumes the role of a beggar, which is fun for him. For a real beggar, it's not a fun at all. I mean, he's really... For a real beggar, begging is, 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 is very painful. But for an actor, who himself is a multi-millionaire, begging is very great pleasure. He enjoys the pleasure of begging. Can you, can you imagine? He enjoys the pleasure of begging. Because he's not really begging. He cannot enjoy if he was really a beggar. He certainly could not enjoy it. He enjoys the pleasure of begging. When does he enjoy? When he's aware that he's not a beggar, even when he's begging. That's called transcending the beggar. So even while he's begging, he transcends the beggar. The only problem can come if this beggar somehow forgets himself. Somehow, because of whatever problems, because of some difficulty he had in the morning and therefore he was not inspired to go on the stage. And then he was pushed onto the stage and then he had to him, take him, help himself with some drinks, I guess, you know, in order to motivate himself to do something. And when he took a bit too much, then he, then he looked at himself in the mirror with his head very high or whatever it is, you know. And he found a beggar in that mirror. He thought he was a beggar. And thus if the actor really thinks that he's a beggar, then life becomes very painful. He need not be a beggar to suffer from the pain of begging. All that is necessary is for him to think that he's a beggar, that's all. He need not be a beggar to suffer the pain of begging. All that is necessary is for him to think, that's all. That notion is enough. He thinks that he's a beggar, that's all. All the pleasure of begging is gone, all the pain comes. He finds himself limited in every way. The only way that he can become free from the sense of, uh, sense of poverty, impoverishment, is by knowing that he is not a beggar. Something like that. So self becomes a substratum, we call it. Adhishthanam. The sitting duck for all kinds of projections. Vadanvak. Never while talking. Well, in fact, the act of speaking takes place, no doubt. But the act of speaking takes place at the level of speech. And Bhagavad Gita described in more than one places. What is the act of speaking? Is nothing but the faculty of speaking, interacting with the words. What is hearing? Is nothing but the faculty of hearing, interacting with the words again or sounds. So all these actions are taking place only at the level of personality, but on account of identifying the personality. The self thinks that he is doing this, and that is how I suffer from this complexes of being karta and bhokta, doer and enjoyer. And many other complexes that arise from that. This is called samsara. And the 15th chapter opens with a very beautiful description of samsara. The samsara is described in the form of a tree. Hey, but Swami, you just told us that this chapter is meant for giving the knowledge of identity of Jiva and Brahma. It's meant for giving knowledge of Paramatma. Why are you talking about samsara? That is because that it is necessary also to know the samsara. Because Lord Krishna said, Arjuna asked this question, What is the means of gaining this knowledge, O Lord? Maam chayo vibhicharena bhakti yogena sevate sagunan samadityaitan brahma bhuyaya kalpate Maam chaya abhivicharena bhakti yogena sevate The one who worships me with bhakti yoga, with unswerving devotion to me. So one who worships me with unswerving devotion, by my grace he gains this knowledge. So Lord Krishna says, I am the giver of knowledge, I am also the giver of the karma phala, the result of action. At the same time, I am also the giver of the devotion, result of devotion. So result of actions can be anything that we want, including heavens. The result of devotion is, again, what we want, 
but if through devotion, avya vichare and yogena, Lord Krishna says, those who worship me for my sake. And in the 10th chapter it was told, how I light the lamp of knowledge in the heart and dispel the darkness of ignorance. So knowledge also is gained by the grace of God. And that is why we've been saying that in order for me to know God, it, be, it is very necessary that God should become favorable to me. I should make him favorable to me. That becomes my task. As Lord Krishna says in the fourth chapter, that may you go to these teachers who are wise and enlightened, and they will impart knowledge to you. But before they impart the knowledge, it is necessary for you to make them favorable to you. Don't just go and ask, start asking questions, he may not reply to you. Even if he replies, it may not make sense to you. Tadviddhi pranipatena, pariprashtena sevaya. You must, you must establish a, 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 a sort of a tuning of a harmony with the teacher. Tadviddhi pranipatena, with a long prostration. Sevaya, by serving the teacher. Pariprashtena, with right questions. So thus by, by surrendering to him, by serving him and by asking him the right questions at the right time, you make him favor. You know, prasannam tamanuprapya. You find teacher is prasanna. He is pleased with you. Oh, I did not know. I thought the teachers are always pleased. We thought teachers are always supposed to be pleased. What do they need for being? That is all right. They are always pleased, okay. And they are pleased with everybody also. But then, Still it is necessary that he should become pleased with you as a student. He should discover in you a jignasu, a desirer of knowledge. Similarly also the Lord is always pleased with everybody. Lord is always favorable to everybody. His grace is equally available to everybody. And still I must do something on my part to receive that grace. Just as you say, the light of sun is available to everybody. But I must open my window for that light to flood into my house, then alone my house can be lighted up. That much I have to do. Even though the sunlight is equally available to everybody, I have to do something, little thing, not much. Just a little thing, just open the window, that's all I have to do. Similarly also the grace of Lord is available to everybody. I just have to do one thing, to open the gates of my heart, that is called bhakti or the devotion. This is what we mean by making the Lord favorable to me. Maam chayo vichārena bhakti yogena sevade Lord Krishna says, one who serves me, who worships me with unswerving devotion. Lord Krishna says, when I am the only object of devotion, when he worships me and nothing else. It's interesting how even in the chapter of the knowledge, the worship comes. We think bhakti is something different, you know. So they think that bhakta is the one who only sings bhajans, you know. And they think that this sannyasi are not bhakta. You know? These are all, so they are, they are all jnana marga. Jnana marga is path of knowledge. But again and again, Lord Krishna brings in bhakti even in the context of knowledge. In the 13th chapter, when Lord Krishna talked about the qualifications that a seeker of knowledge should cultivate, in those 20, you know the 20 point, this 20 qualifications, the values. In the 13th chapter, Lord Krishna gives a whole list of 20 values, prescribes the values that a seeker should cultivate for him to become qualified for knowledge. In those, one of the values is mai chananya yogena bhakti yoga, mai chananya yogena bhakti avyavicharani. Lord Krishna said avyavicharani bhakti unswerving devotion, faithful devotion, ananya yogena. Lord Krishna says he should only be devotee of mind and nobody else. Because each one of us is a bhakta, each one of us is a devotee, born devotee. And every moment we are always worshipping something. At, every, at any moment I am always a devotee of something or the other. Depending upon what it is that is most important to me at that moment. If at a given moment my pride is most important to me, I am a devotee of my pride. My image is most important, I am a devotee of the image. I do anything that is necessary to make sure that my image. If wealth is important, I am a devotee of that. 
If fame is important, I'm a devotee of that. Every moment, I'm always a devotee. So Lord Krishna says, Maam chayo vivicharena bhakti yogena sevade One who is devoted to me at the exclusion of all other devotions. So it is not that we have to become devotees, but that we have to really, we have to, then also Viveka or discrimination is required so that our devotion also becomes mature devotion, that's all. So devotion we have, what we need is mature devotion. And therefore, how to create that maturity? By what we call Vairagya. What is required both for Bhakti as well as Jnanam is Vairagya. For bhakti also, for devotion also, vairagya, this passion is required. When can I worship God? When can I worship anything? When I have reverence, when I have love, and when I get pleasure out of that, understand? I can worship God also, provided I get pleasure out of worshipping God, otherwise who can do that? Children also, we teach them, do this prayer, and then during the camp they learn all kinds of prayers which will last 15-20 minutes. Then they go home and slowly and slowly, in the beginning, you know, for a week I think the effect remains, and they are very sincere, and the parents are really pleased. Oh, the Guru Kulam has really changed my child. Every morning Swami wakes up and does his prayer for 25 minutes. And slowly the effect starts wearing out after three months and twenty-five minutes becomes fifteen minutes and becomes ten minutes and becomes five minutes. And at the end of, before he coming to the next camp, then next year, you know what? Before going to school he just stands there for a second and then goes away, that's all. These things don't, you know, we, we, we wish, Swami, I wish that I could do my puja and I could do my chanting and I could do japa, all sorts of things I like to do. But Swami, I don't have time. I'm so pressed for time in the morning. Well, the same person has enough time to do whatever is required, you know. I mean, they take 45 minutes to 50 minutes or one hour in the bathroom. There's enough time for that. Enough time to dress up, enough time to do all those things. These are the important things. Because I enjoy doing them also. I look at myself and see how I look and everything. It's nice, pleasure. But when I'm doing puja, when I'm reciting Vishnu Sahasana, when I'm doing Gayatri Mantra, and then I don't enjoy it at all. If there is no rasa, what we require is rasa. Rasa means pleasure. There must be rasa swada, enjoyment must be there. Then alone something we can do. Otherwise we can do is an obligatory duty. That we can do, of course. Mother said you won't get food or breakfast unless you finish this. Therefore he does it, that's okay. That's what we call obligatory duties. Lot of, you know, many of such duties we do. But what I do my, my own interest is that when I can enjoy what I am doing. So when God becomes enjoyable to me, I have no problem in worshipping because I worship anything that is enjoyable to me. So what is meant by Vairagya? Vairagya means freedom from Raga. Raga means attachment. At the moment, why am I attached to the things? Because things of the world give me pleasure when I am going to be attached to them. As long as something gives me pleasure or happiness, I'm bound to be attached because all that matters to me is not even God. What matters to me is happiness. Nothing matters to me other than happiness. And whatever gives me happiness, that is where my mind will go. Just as a fly will go or, or a honeybee will only go to the honey. My mind will go where it gets that pleasure or joy. Except that the point is, that my mind seems to get pleasure or joy out of enjoying or out of experiencing objects of the world, is it really getting the joy from there? Or the joy, the pleasure that seems to come from the objects of the world is really because of imagination, because I, I just assume that that is where the pleasure is and that is why I'm getting it. In short, the pleasure that I seem to be getting from the various things of the world, is it the genuine pleasure or is it again another delusion of pleasure? Is it real pleasure or mithya pleasure? The answer is that joy or happiness is mithya. Sorry, what are you talking? Oh, when I eat a slice of pizza, I'm really, I enjoy it. Give me a nice candy. 
So these, you know, the children here don't enjoy these Indian sweets. It's too sweet. I never thought thing can be too sweet. As the sweeter the better, but here says it's too sweet for me. And so they like sweets all right, but then that has the right amount of sweetness. Give them that, that, give them that. You know, every time they, in the dining hall, somebody uh, uh, takes one, uh, what do you call it, one plate and starts banging. Oh, immediately attention. And children, hey, birthday again, you know. And you can see their eyes, it just opens because another cake is coming. And then Lan says, this is an announcement about swimming pool. <laughs> and there's tremendous disappointment. But I see even five-year-old children, you know, hey, another birthday. It doesn't matter whose birthday it is because there is cake there. Like this child comes home, you know, happy. He comes home from the school. He went and within half an hour he came back. Mom asked him, hey, what happened? You seem to be happy. Oh, we have a day off today. Why? Oh, principal died. <laughs> but all that he cares is that he, has, he doesn't have to go to school. That's all. And so, somebody can easily ask, Mama, you, you can't say that this doesn't give me, it does give me pleasure. It does give me happiness. And unless this becomes clear, nothing will work. As long as my mind continues to think that the pleasure or happiness comes from outside, from the world, understanding it, whatever level it remains, unless I discover, unless Vairagya is there, Unless viveka or discrimination is there, and vairagya, dispassion arising from viveka, unless that is there, my mind is just not available. And therefore Vedanta also wants us to analyze every experience of happiness, whether the happiness that seems to be coming from the objects of pleasure, is it the real happiness or is it merely an illusion of happiness? The answer is, it is not real happiness. Like a dog that is chewing a bone, a dry bone, and the dog keeps on chewing and chewing, and what does it get out of it? There's nothing in that bone at all. But the dog seems to be really relishing it. What is it? It's getting a lot of rasa juice out of that, something out of that. And what is it? Nothing but his own blood. So when it is chewing on that bone, the bone is Sharp, sharp edges of the bone really hurt the mouth and the mouth is bleeding and he seems to be tasting his own blood. And the dog thinks that I, this is what I am told. I don't know whether the people or dogs have they, they have discovered this or not. I don't think they would ever allow the dog to chew this kind of bone anyway. But anyway, these stray dogs, you know, they are not educated. <laughs> therefore, they do this. We will perhaps train our dog and therefore they, our dog may not eat that bone. But the stray dogs. You see them trying, trying, they're doing that. What is it? In fact, he's tasting his own blood. The dog thinks that, that blood is coming from that bone. In fact, he's tasting his own blood. This is an example that is often given. The example of how a delusion can be created, thinking that I'm getting something out of somewhere else, whereas it is coming from my own self. And similarly also, the happiness that I seem to get from the things and beings of the world that is not really coming from there, it is coming from my own self. Because one simple rule is this, Vijnanam Anandam Brahma. Upanishad says that that is the Vijnanam or consciousness is Anandam. Ananda or happiness can be only in consciousness, a jada or inner thing cannot give me happiness. So inner things cannot give me happiness, it is only consciousness that can give me happiness. And therefore, whatever happiness I experience comes from the consciousness that is myself. And this understanding is very necessary for me to be able to fold up my mind, withdraw my mind from its unnecessary preoccupation, from a tremendous uh, squandering of my time and energy. Then my mind becomes together. Right now it is scattered into hundreds of places because he find, finds happiness in all sorts of places. When I understand the real nature of those things and I understand that that is not where the happiness Atmas tu kamaya saram prem bhavati that whatever is dear to me is because the self is dear to me. Whatever seems to give me happiness is because the self gives me happiness. When that understanding comes and when it becomes in my own understanding 
that mature viveka and vairagya is what is required even for devotion. Because then I realize that even when I am enjoying a slice of pizza, it is God that gives me, brings happiness and not that thing. That just becomes, just becomes a nimitta, just becomes a, a, an occasion, just becomes an instrument. So vairagya, in short, vairagya, a dispassion or freedom from wrong fascination from the world or the objects of the world is required. In short, cultivating a healthy attitude in the world. Understand vairagya or dispassion doesn't mean running away from the world or turning away from the world. In fact, it is establishing a right or healthy attitude in the world. That is when my mind enjoys vairagya, that is when I can really enjoy the world. And thus, vairagya. Therefore, the first some verses here in this 15th chapter are devoted to a description of samsara. So that we know what it is. And that's how the mind discovers a dispassion for them by, under, by understanding their true nature. And here Lord Krishna employs an imagery of a tree to describe the samsara. <coughs> and that is how the first verse, so vairagya is required for bhakti and bhakti is required for jnanam. So we require vairagya for both bhakti and jnanam. This is a chapter on jnanam. Fifteen chapter is the chapter on jnanam. Shankaraja says that you worship the Lord and by His grace you gain the knowledge. And by knowledge you become free. Then what to talk of becoming free for directly gaining the knowledge? Therefore, this fifteen chapter directly discussing what you call tattva or the truth or the reality of our life. And before discussing that, Lord Krishna describes samsara in the form of a tree, because that is what is the tradition of the Upanishads also. Not only Bhagavad Gita, but elsewhere also, this kind of imagery of tree is given. And that is what Lord Krishna follows here. Because Bhagavad Gita is the essence of the Upanishads. And we'll find that all the ideas are there in the Upanishads in some place or the other. Sometimes the same words are there, same expressions are there. Urdha Moolaha, Adashakaha, Esho Shvatta Sanatanaha. So that is the verse from the Kathopanishad. And that and similar verses form the basis of this description of, of samsara in the form of a tree on the part of Lord Krishna. So let us read the first verse here. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha, Shri Bhagavan Uvacha, Urdhva Moola Madhashakam, Urdhva Moola Madhashakam, Ashvatham Prahuravyayam, Ashvatham Prahuravyayam, Chandam Siyasya Parnani, Chandam Siyasya Parnani, Yastam Veda Saveda Vita, Yastam Veda Saveda Vita. Shri Bhagavan Vacha, the Blessed Lord Himself said, recognizing that Arjuna had some questions in his mind, although Arjuna does not overtly ask any question, as again and again we have been saying that the, the, the custom or the tradition is that this knowledge will be imparted only to the one who asks for it. And therefore we find many chapters of Bhagavad Gita opening with a question or a, doubt, a question on the part of Arjuna. Whereas we also find many chapters opening with a statement of Lord Krishna without any question overtly being asked by Arjuna. However, when Lord Krishna finds that the statements that he made in the previous chapter would have raised certain questions in the mind of the student, then even though the questions are not overtly or openly asked, Lord Krishna answers those questions. And so the question would be, that by the grace of the Lord, one gains the knowledge. By the knowledge, one discovers oneself with guna atitaha, the one that is free from the gunas. And that's how one discovers the freedom. So what's the nature of that knowledge? And what is the nature of the truth, knowing which the wise person becomes liberated? And so that question will be there. Therefore, Lord Krishna wants to unfold the truth here. And that is why he opens this chapter. The chapter opens with his statement. 
However, as I said before, unfolding the nature of the truth, Lord Krishna here uh, described, as I said, the samsara for us to develop and discover a vairagya for the samsara, a dispassion for the samsara. <coughs> so, Sri Bhagavan Vacha, that's why Lord Krishna himself says, answering this query on the part of Arjuna as to what's the nature of truth, knowing which one becomes wise. Urdhumulam adashakam ashvatham prahuhu avyayam. Prahuhu, they say, see, I'm, I'm reading the translation here. Uh, if you want to compare the words with the translation, Prahuhu, they say, what? Ashvatham, the people tree. Urdhumulam, which has its roots upward. Adashakam, and the branches downward. Chandamsi yasya, yasya of which? Chandamsi the Vedas, Paranani they are the leaves. Chandamsi yasya Paranani of which? The Vedas are the leaves. Prahu avyayam, it is called avyayam. This tree of samsara is said to be imperishable. So that is the description of the tree of samsara. Yastam Veda Saveda Vid. Oh Lord, why should we bother about knowing this tree of samsara? Lord Krishna says, Yastam Veda, the one who knows it or realizes it. Veda Vita is a knower of the Vedas. So knowing this tree is important for us because knowing the tree of samsara along with its root, one becomes the knower of the Vedas. One becomes omniscient. One knows everything that needs to be known in this life. So all that we need to know in the life is this tree and its root, that's all. Once we know that, all that is necessary to know has been known. And so, the samsara is compared to the tree. What kind of a tree? Ashwatha. Ashwatha means people tree. As Shankaraja explains, Ashwatha. Ashwastha. So, Ashwatha word, let me just write down here so that uh, it becomes clear to you how this word is derived. Ashwatham is broken as A. Swash. That's how these three elements are there. A means not. It's a particle which creates a negative sense. Shwas means tomorrow. You know, thumb means thaw. Thaw means to be. So then uh, Ashwatham means what? That which will not be tomorrow. Ashwat, Ashwatham, that That's the meaning. Sometimes they also say Ashwatha. Can also say Ashwa. You know, Ashwa means a horse. Sta means Sta means remains or stands. Perhaps 
they used to tie their horses under this tree, you know, Ashwa. So, sometimes they say that this is a tree, the people tree. Everybody must have seen the people tree. It's a very interesting tree because the leaves are the, the leaves are so many, the branches are always bending down. Of this people tree, the branches are always bending down. Not only that, but because of the breeze, these trees, the, the branch, the leaves keep on uh, being sh shaking. And so all the time you see the branches all the time. There is, it, there is never a moment almost where this tree just stands still. It's always, the, there is always movement in the tree. To such an extent that people get scared, you know. So the Ashwatha, this tree, the people tree, people get scared. It keeps on making sounds. At night, so people think that that is where the ghost is, you know. So <laughs> they generally don't, you know, they don't go near that at night because thinking there is ghost. Because the tree keeps on making some sound. It keeps on all the time uh, sort of moving. The branches keep on moving. There is always movement in the tree. And sound in the tree is never the same next moment. All the time changing, constantly changing. That's why the Ashwatha tree. Where samsara also is everything in the creation, all it's constantly changing. Never the same. It looks like it, it looks like the sun is the same. Every day the same sun is arising. And the, the, the same sun does not in fact arise. It's a different sun every day. We think river the same water is flowing. Never the same water. Not till the next moment the water is the same. Nothing is the same in the next moment. And that's every moment thing that is changing and changing. So huh? Sorry to bother you. There's an emergency. We need to talk to people. Okay. Yeah. So that is why perhaps this tree is chosen to compare with samsara, which is constantly changing. There's always movement, always change. No two moments are ever the same. Also, horse, you know? Horse also is always identified with motion. So horse also is constantly moving and so the like Ashwavattishtari, so the tree which is like, so like horse, which always is on the move, constantly moving. So horse also implies movement. <coughs> or even the horse is standing, but still the movement is always potentially there and thus movement change is what is intended by, by comparing the samsara with the Ashwatta tree. <coughs> And of course, this is called a vruksha. That is another thing that I should also mention there. It is tree. See, tree is called vruksha in Sanskrit. And that is derived from the root rust. In the sense of chedane. Is <coughs> that in the sense of pali? So derivatively the word bruksha. means that which can be felt. So that is also important. A tree can be felt. A tree is something that will perpetuate itself normally. If you don't, if some natural calamity does not happen, or if something does not occur, you will go on and on. And even if, like, sometimes uh, this, the Ashwatha is also translated as, as Banyan tree. And Banyan tree, everybody knows, at least in India, they know how Banyan tree perpetuates itself because the secondary branches, the roots also come, and then uh, they themselves become the stem, and that's how it keeps on propagating itself. Even ordinarily, also tree lasts for a very long time, and then the tree brings out the 
flowers and fruits and the fruits bring out the seeds and seeds bring out it under trees and that is also it perpetuates. So tree means that which perpetuates itself. That is why in this verse, Lord Avyayam, this tree of samsara is imperishable. That is any tree also is almost imperishable. You know, it's sort of uh, for our, our lifespan, you know, there are trees which are 300 years old and 400 years old and things like that. And this, this uh, particularly in the Banyan trees can be very old, very old. As Swami was saying in Calcutta, there is this uh, botanical park where I guess the Banyan trees occupy some one acre of uh, area, it looks like. And we don't know where the origin is, where is the original stem. But it's not there in fact, so it's, it's said that here the original stem was, you know, but then it's, it's not even there. But still the tree keeps on perpetuating. So in that sense also, this vruksha or the tree is, 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 is used for imagining, imagining the samsara. However, important thing about vruksha, even though if you don't do something about it, it will keep on perpetuating itself. But we can do something about it, and that is Vrushanam, that Chedanam, that it can be felt, it can be cut asunder and felt. Not ordinary trees, we need not do that. But tree of samsara, the tree of samsara definitely is that which can be cut asunder and felt. That is why it is, it is compared to a tree. <coughs> and so, Udhamulam Adhishasam Ashwatham Prahu Avyayam Prahu, they say. That there is this tree of samsara, which Ashvatham is comparable to a people tree, avyayam, and that is imperishable or undecaying avyayam. So that which will never, which will never get, that will never die, never decay, will never perish, if you do not do something about it. If you do something about it, of course, then it can be felt. That's the idea of using the image of the tree in describing the samsara. Okay, we'll continue to discuss in the next class. Om Puranamada Puranamidam Puranat Puranamudachyade Puranasya Puranamadaya Puranameva Vashashyade Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Badarayanam Sutra Bhashya Krutau Vande Bhagavanta Punapunaha Ishwara Guru Ratmedi Murti Bheda Vibhagine Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om